Good morning, everyone. My name is Ine Slaughter. I'm the executive director of Indigenous Language Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And today I'll be the moderator for this exciting web symposium. Welcome to the ILI web symposium. And this is the first of seven more presentations this year. Uh, we first of all wanna acknowledge and deeply thank Lannan Foundation for their support of this year's web symposium series. A little bit of housekeeping before we go on. Um, you are all entered into this Zoom meeting, muted, except for our presenter and moderator. Please feel free to put your comments or questions in the chat box or even post your reactions. This is being recorded and it will be posted on ILI's YouTube channel. After the presentation, we will take a 10 minute break. And then uh, during that time, do not turn off anything, just leave the screen on and go take your break. Um, so please don't click on any buttons. And during or oh, after the break, we will do the question and answer session then the questions must be posted on chat and the moderator will facilitate that session. And that part is about 30 minutes at the most. So let me please introduce you to our today's presenter, Elessa Sierra Concha. She, her ancestry is Lakota Anishinaabe Taos. She has a Bachelor of Science in English and a Master of Arts degree in Indigenous Education. She's been dedicated to the Lakota language revitalization movement since 2018. Why, you must have only been a child. <laughs> so working in various capacities, such as a Lakota dual immersion educator, adult Lakota language educator, and curriculum developer, for the Lakota Dual Immersion Program. She was appointed to <clears throat> ILI's Board of Directors in 2022, and we are so honored to have her on our board. And let's see, her, her topic today is waking up, finding my path through Lakota, <clears throat> I hope I'm saying this right, Lakota Tiyapi. So please welcome Sierra Concha. All right, thank you. Okay, um, hey, honey, watch day, everybody. Um, Alyssa Sierra Concha, Emachiapi, Chante watch day, and I she use a big show. Um, I am so grateful to be here. I'm a little nervous, so excuse my nerves. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about my journey in uh, becoming fluent in the Lakota language, um, as well as my journey with, uh, with my job. And I wanna talk to you all about our work that we're doing, um, our dual immersion program and everything that comes with it. Um, and I do wanna emphasize that um, Every indigenous language fluency journey, every person's journey is very unique. It's very special. Um, and so this is mine in my story and my life. And um, because of that, I would like to issue a content warning, a trigger warning. Uh, there are some things in my life, in my journey that could be upsetting to people. And so I wanted to open up with that. Um, before I get into my personal journey, though, I wanted to first discuss the Lakota language and where it's at, uh, which is something that I'm sure many Indigenous peoples are familiar with, which is our Indigenous language, the Lakota language, is an endangered language um, due to generations of boarding schools and assimilation and mass genocide. Uh, so it got to the point where in 2017, it was reported 
that there are less than 5,000 fluent Lakota speakers, uh, the majority of them being over 70 years old. And since then, uh, due to the pandemic, due to just aging, we have lost many more elders since then. Uh, I think as of 2022, um, it was reported that there are less than 2,000 Lakota fluent speakers now, uh, still the majority being over 70 years old. And so two people that I work with that are very close to my heart, their names are Matt Rama and Peter Hill. They understood this. They understood that the Lakota language was in a very dire condition, was very in a very dire circumstance. And they wanted to help with that. And there were two educators. And in 2012, they decided to start a Lakota immersion daycare. Um, and they had no funding, no money, nothing, but they had this idea, this dream, and they wanted to pursue it. And so they opened up a daycare out of Peter Hill's home um, and started out with five babies. And uh, they they kept growing small, uh, little by little with some kids enrolling here and there. Um, and there's this story that they like to tell where it was some years since they had opened the daycare and one of their students was at a Sundance ceremony in the summer and she was about three or four at this time and she began talking to an elder in Lakota um, and they were having this conversation back and forth and people noticed that people sitting around them realized look there's this baby who's uh, speaking fluently and understanding fluently in Lakota and they that wasn't normal um, that was shocking to see someone so young to be fluent in our indigenous language and so people began asking where did she learn what is what is this what's happening this is this is beautiful and so by word of mouth uh, people began talking more about this small Lakota immersion daycare running out of Peter Hill's home. And they grew in support, they grew in funding, and uh, it got to the point where um, these the oldest kids were gonna go into kindergarten. And Matt and Peter really wanted to continue this immersion program because they were seeing how beautiful it is in the daycare and they wanted to see where it could go. And so, um, luckily, they partnered up with Machbia Luta Owaiowa, which is Red Cloud School in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And Red Cloud gave them a classroom so where they could continue their Lakota immersion program. And as they get older, as they um, so if they go into first grade, second grade, third grade, they would be able to continue that. And in 2019. Uh, Machbia Luta Owaiwa saw how incredible this one classroom was um, and they decided as a school to make the school a Lakota immersion school, Lakota dual immersion school. And so then on the year of 2019, they had their first kindergarten official kindergarten class, the only kindergarten class of Red Cloud School to be a Lakota dual immersion class. And with that, they would continue to grow. So then kinder and first, the next year would be dual immersion, kinder first, second, kinder first, third. Um, and so our oldest group uh, is now in third grade. And our original cohort uh, are now in uh, third or fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So where, where do I come into the picture? Um, in 2012, I was still in high school. <laughs> um, and in 2015, I was attending the University of New Mexico for my bachelor's and I needed a part-time job. Um, and this, this part-time job with the immersion program would allow me to work remotely because it was uh, very uh, tech savvy, I should say. Um, so 
I was taking translations from fluent speakers and putting them into books um, and putting them on a website. I was making their website. I created animation videos with Lakota scripts that the fluent speakers would give to me. I also uh, took translations and inputted them into worksheets. So I began helping develop the kinder curriculum. Um, and even at this point, I had very minimal Lakota language knowledge. Um, I had two years of Lakota language classes in high school, but I didn't retain much. It wasn't something that interested me. So I knew a few phrases. Um, and going into this job, I treated it as a job. So I didn't invest my time in actually learning the language. I simply would just take the translations and input them. Uh, so it was very minimal. Um, but then uh, throughout the summers, I would come home and I was able to work on site either at the daycare or at Red Cloud School. Um, and there my colleagues would provide classes for me. Uh, and it wasn't a very consistent uh, course, but I would take some classes here and there from my colleagues and uh, Matt and Peter and my colleagues began to notice that I could catch on very quickly, that I was retaining the language very, very fast, and that piqued their interest. So um, I transferred to Black Hill State University in 2016, um, and that was due to um, a series of traumatic events that happened while attending the University of New Mexico, uh, and I wanted to be closer to home. Uh, the Black Hill State University is in Spearfish, South Dakota, which is about two and a half to three hours uh, from Pine Ridge, a lot closer than uh, 12 hours, <laughs> uh, which is where, how far Un University of New Mexico is. Um, and at this point, I uh, decided to major in English and minor in Native American studies. And back then, if you were to ask me, well, what are you gonna do after college? What are your plans? I would shrug you off. Um, I didn't really have a plan. Um, and honestly, I didn't really care to have a plan. I just, was taking it day by day, just kind of floating around, um, taking my classes. Uh, and I was honestly very lost. Um, and this um, leads up to March of 2017. Um, leading up to March in 2017 was a very, very dark period of my life. Um, I began partying a lot. I turned to alcohol uh, to the point where I, I was, the only times that I was sober was when I was sleeping. Hold on. And so uh, one day in March, 2017, I, decided to take my own life. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I don't remember much from that day to be, or from that night, to be honest. I remember waking up in the emergency room and my phone was blowing up from my friends and my family. And I was transported to a facility in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, and that was where my family picked me up and they took me home uh, to Pine Ridge. And I stayed home for about two and a half, three weeks. And, you know, I wish I could say that as soon as I was taken home, I was better, right? I was healed. I wanted to live again and everything was okay. But as we all know, uh, that's never the case, right? Healing is not linear. You can't just wake up and be okay. 
Um, so when I went home, I was still very fixated on my bad coping mechanisms and my bad habits um, where I was sneaking in alcohol, I was sneaking in drugs and just finding any way so that I could numb what I was feeling. So I didn't have to confront what I was feeling. Um, and to this day, it hurts me to say that, you know, me being the oldest of 10, uh, there were many of my siblings that still lived at home at that time, and they were seeing me in this dark period. They were experiencing me in this dark period, and um, that would later come to influence where I am today. Um, but it got to a point where my parents couldn't just stand by anymore, um, and so they confronted me about this and basically were just saying, what is happening? What is going on here? We don't even know who you are anymore. Um, and I, and in this conversation, it was very hard, but it was very necessary because I said something that became a revelation where I said, I don't like myself. And as soon as those words left my lips, it made sense. Why, why was I doing everything that I was doing? Why was I throwing away relationships? Why was I throwing away my future? I just, I didn't like myself. Whenever I looked at myself in the mirror, I didn't know who I was. Um, and that became a very big turning point for me, which I will talk about soon. But I want to first really focus on that statement that I said, um, which was me not liking myself, because I feel like many Indigenous peoples, many Indigenous youth have this same mentality. At some point in their lives, they feel that too. And of course, there are many factors that go into that. Um, and for me as well, I have some trauma, unresolved trauma that I was experiencing. But something that I began to realize over the years through a lot of therapy, a lot of healing, and through this work was this idea comes from our education system. Um, our students, our children, ourselves, we grew up where we would attend school eight hours a day five days a week, nine months out of the year. That is most of our childhood, right? Um, and our education system, dating back to the 1880s, when the first ever school was, was made for Indigenous peoples, it had this foundation to assimilate Indigenous peoples, to silence us, to conform us, to become silent members of society where we weren't indigenous, right? The motto of the first boarding school was kill the Indian, save the man. And that was our, that is the foundation of our education system in relations to indigenous peoples. And since then, some changes have been made here and there, which we're all grateful for, right? But this is our foundation which means at the core of our Western education system, it is still designed to silence us, to not celebrate us, to not acknowledge us, essentially to just make us like them, right? Um, and this led up to my education experience. Um, I remember growing up in school and, I was one of few native students and there was never a time whenever our history was acknowledged, our current issues weren't acknowledged, nothing. Um, so I felt very alone growing up. I have one memory of when they acknowledged indigenous peoples. I was in third grade and it was the week of Thanksgiving and they split up all of us brown people, whether we were native or not, if you were brown, you were in this classroom. If you were white, you were put in this classroom. And they asked us to dress up as Indians and pilgrims. 
And so I, of course, was put with the Indian group and they were having the, us make feathers and put it on our heads. And the kids, you know, they, they didn't know any better. They were, you know, uh, acting as, um, as they think a native would. And I remember crying because this felt so wrong. And I didn't understand even then as a third grader, I didn't understand how wrong it was then, but it felt wrong to me where the, the first time my people were being acknowledged was in this way where we were being segregated and just adhering to stereotypes. Um, and so I, I remember that being a very key point in my life where I didn't, I stopped really appreciating who I was and where I came from because everywhere I looked, I wasn't being celebrated in the education system. Um, and that only escalated whenever I began attending um, a middle school in Albuquerque that is elite. It's a great private school. Um, but I was one of two natives out of the entire school that ran from sixth through 12th grade. And the only other native student, he was in high school. So I never saw him. Um, and this is a very formative period in our lives, right? Uh, becoming a preteen to becoming a teenager. Um, and I was surrounded by people who could not relate to me whatsoever. I came from middle class. I am native. I pray differently than them. I don't go to church. I would go to sweat. I would attend our ceremonies and Sundance ceremonies. And no one around me understood that or knew that. Um, and our core curriculum didn't acknowledge that. They didn't acknowledge that us indigenous peoples have a different way of being, a different way of learning and a different lifestyle. Um, so just looking back on my education system leading up to eighth grade, there was hardly ever a time where I felt very comfortable in who I was or proud of who I was because I was never celebrated. I was never acknowledged. And that goes back to this education system where that is exactly what it is designed to do. It is being successful in making us feel like we're the other, right? It's making, it's successful in trying to have us conform in silence. And so going back to 2017, when I had this revelation, um, I, once I said it, I realized, you know, I want to, I want to like myself though, right? Um, and so despite uh, my parents not wanting me to, I packed a bag, left my phone, left my car, and I decided to go back to school. <clears throat> um, and uh, I understand now, back then I didn't understand, but I understand now why my parents were so against me going back is because they were terrified. Um, they were terrified of me for me. Um, but I knew in my heart that this was something that I needed to, that I needed to do in order to start liking myself again. I needed to finish what I had started in going to school. Um, so I moved to Rapid City, South Dakota with my grandma and which is about 40 minutes away from Black Hill State University. And uh, I found rides from my friends, from my grandparents. I, would, would, I was selling my clothes to pay them gas money just so I could get to class every single day. Um, I had a lot of extra meetings with my professors I wrote a lot of extra essays because at that point I had missed about two weeks of classes. I was, I was really, really behind. And I'm so lucky that my professors were so understanding in everything that I was going through. So I did a lot of extra work. I put in a lot of extra work and I finished out that school year, thankfully, uh, with decent grades. And I only had one year left of college. And so 
when I made those first steps to go back to school and everything, like I said, uh, healing isn't linear, right? I, I had a lot of bad days. I had a lot of good days. I was very up and down. But something that had shifted in me was now I wanted to do something. I was starting to think about my future, which is something that I hadn't done in years. Um, so I was coming up on my graduation, which was in May of 2018. And Matt uh, approached me and he asked, you know, what are you doing after college? What, what are your plans? And this was the first time in years where I didn't just shrug my shoulders and not care. I told him, I don't know, but I know for sure I want to go back home. And I know that I want to make a difference in our community. And I just don't know how I'm going to do that, but that's what I want to do. And he said, uh, well, uh, there's this position open to be the kindergarten Lakota immersion teacher. Um, and he said, you know, you have experience in developing curriculum. You know the kids. You're really good with the kids. And I've seen how well you pick up on Lakota. And he said, just try it out. Just see, just see what happens. And if you don't like it, that's totally fine. Um, you can move on the year after that. He said, but let's just try it. Um, and so I said, yes. Um, and in that summer of 2018, I studied so hard. I uh, attended an intensive five-week Lakota language uh, program for adults. Uh, and after that, I was just studying, 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 talking with fluent speakers, asking all these questions, making curriculum, and actually for the first time paying attention to what the translations of the curriculum was and what these worksheets were saying. Um, and come August 2018, um, it, I was still at a beginner level for sure. Um, but this first year of teaching completely changed my life, changed my perspective. Um, because, you know, it was the hardest thing I think I've ever had to do to this day. That first year of teaching, I will say, was, was the hardest but most beautiful year of my life. Because I, because I was a beginner, um, it was very hard to stay in the language but that was the one rule of taking on this job was once you get into that classroom no english we are here to speak and teach in our language and these are for our kids and so i took that very seriously to the point where i was working 12 14 sometimes more hours a day because i was teaching eight hours a day and then I would go home and I would study or I would have sessions with a fluent speaker where I could ask them grammar questions and they could teach me vocabulary. And then I would work on curriculum development where I would make lessons for the next day. And then I would write on flashcards the directions of how to teach this particular lesson. Um, so I have somewhere in my stuff, a bag of thousands of flashcards from this first year of teaching because I didn't know like what's two plus two equals four. I had to know how to say all of these things so that our students could have a strong academic experience as well as it being in Lakota. And even though it was difficult, um, I look back now and I, I see that there was a shift in me. Um, I think most people can relate to this uh, growing up and going through college years. We're very focused on ourselves, right? Um, you know, our world is still very small. Our perspective is very small where it's just, you wake up and you think of me, like, what am I gonna do today? What are, like me, me, which is what I did. Um, but then taking on this job, I would wake up and it wouldn't just, it wouldn't be me. I would wake up and think about our kids. Um, you know, are the lessons going to be good enough for them today? Are they going to enjoy them today? Uh, what vocabulary are they going to like today? And um, my whole world kind of expanded to this, to this, to them. My perspective became 
them. Um, and our language movement, I realized that I had stepped into this movement that was so beautiful and just way beyond me. I'm one person, but this movement is huge. And so that really helped change my perspective and shifted my way of thinking. And so this is a very condensed resume of mine, um, which Ine had briefly talked about. Um, so I just wanted, but I wanted to show you all and discuss, you know, how big of an impact just taking this kindergarten uh, teaching job has had on me. So I started in 2018. And from there, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with teaching in general. Um, so the following year, I decided to start teaching adult Lakota language classes um, five nights a week um, on top of teaching kids during the day. And as you can see, um, I have been growing along with my students, right? I started in kindergarten and I started teaching beginner level for adults. Um, and then throughout the years, I would move up to intermediate, move up to first grade and so on and so forth. Um, and in 2021, I uh, decided to take this job. Uh, well, I applied for, I shouldn't say I decided to, I applied for it and luckily got it. Um, the Red Cloud K through eight Lakota Literacy Project Coordinator, which I will talk about uh, soon. Um, so I took on that job in 2021. And then this year I still have that job, but I'm also teaching Lakota dual immersion, Lakota language arts, third through fifth. So I'm teaching third through fifth graders right now, only Lakota language arts, um, which is essentially language arts, but through Lakota. Um, and so as you can see, I grew with my students, right? I, so the same students that I had in kindergarten, I am now teaching them, um, which has been an amazing, amazing experience. And I'm also currently teaching the advanced level, our highest level of our adult Lakota language classes. Um, and these are also the same students that I had starting in 2019. Um, so I've been growing along with them as well. So um, something that we get asked a lot, myself and my colleagues is, what is Lakota immersion? What does that mean for you? Um, I think indigenous immersion education is still very new to many people. And so it's hard to grasp exactly what that is. So I wanted to spend some time explaining what Lakota immersion is and what our education system is. Um, so we are essentially teaching our students, all of our subjects through Lakota, in Lakota. So, they're learning math, they're learning how to count money in Lakota. Instead of learning penny, they're learning mazashala. Um, they're learning how to read in Lakota, uh, social studies, science. Um, we're hitting all of the core subjects and teaching it through our language. Um, and we are also very academically rigorous. We want to push our students and challenge them. And so we have intensive compre uh, comprehension lessons for L Lakota language arts. We teach them grammar. Um, and also I want to emphasize how important it is with our, with our curriculum and our education system is that we are a Lakota-based education. We are a culture-based education system. Because like I said, um, the Western education system at the foundation is not meant for us. We can't thrive in that capacity. And so what we're doing is we dismantled that. We completely destroyed that ideas, those, those ideas, those systems. And we are rebuilding from the ground up. You know, instead of just having a simple so uh, social studies lesson about, I can't even think of something right now, but um, we have a social studies lesson on Lakota people, on Wounded Knee, on American Indian movement, you know, things that happen here, things that are relevant to Lakota people. We are focusing through our perspective and our Lakota lens. So for example, with comprehension, 
and they're not just learning any story that we can pick up. Um, we are very, um, what's the word? I'm intentional. We are very intentional about having them read stories that are Lakota stories that have been told for generations, you know, old, old stories that we are using in the classroom. And so on the bottom right, you can see this lesson here, which is actually a unit that we're, that our third through fifth graders are going through right now, are learning right now, um, which is about Black Elk Peak and spring. So for Lakota people, spring is our new year. And every year, Lakota people go to Black Elk Peak, which is Hihankaha Paha in Lakota. We go, we hike there, and we have this ceremony where we offer tobacco ties, prayer flags, and we sing. And so that is our unit right now for our Lakota language arts students is we're, we're reading about it. We're reading about how it was back in the day, um, key vocabulary. Um, and also, all of our students are going to be going to Black Elk Peak as a field trip next week, next Friday, so that they can welcome back the Thunder Beings uh, with, along with our relatives. Uh, so I was hired as the K through eight uh, Lakota Literacy Project Coordinator in 2021. Um, and I really, I wanted to focus uh, on that for a little bit of what that means. So growing up, I don't remember there being indigenous peoples as main characters in books. Our children's books didn't have brown people in it. Um, I didn't feel represented whenever I'd read books, which was part of why I didn't feel like I belonged, right? Because I was, I was never represented anywhere. And so with this literacy project, we decided that we would make kids books, K through eight level books for our children that showed brown kids, that showed them, that showed their relatives, that made them represented, right? That they're the stars of the, our books. So uh, I wanted to highlight these four books that we have made. We currently have about a hundred books made um, at different levels, starting, through, starting in kindergarten, going up. Um, so our bottom left one you see here is Tatanka Kdepi which is about the buffalo harvest. We host an annual buffalo harvest here at the school uh, for K through 12. And this book has pictures of that event of our students participating in the buffalo harvest. And the book talks about the different roles that people have, the different body parts of the buffalo. What, are we, what do we eat? How do we cook it? Um, and so these students get to read this and they are reading it and they say, oh, that happened just right here. You know, like, oh, look, that's me. Oh, look, that's my friend in this book. Um, going to the next one, we Koshkalaka Ma Kopashpe Trapshkatapi. That is a book uh, from last year when our high school girls made it to state. And so our students get to see their older sisters, their older cousins uh, in this book, and they get to feel this sense of pride, right, in our community. They're, they're seeing their relatives make it to state and in this book um so they they get to feel this pride and the next one woke sape it means wisdom we also uh, are focusing on the lakota values and just our lakota perspective and so we have different books on our different lakota values this one being wisdom and there are pictures of our students enacting wisdom once again you know encouraging them to feel this pride saying, oh, I, look at me, I show wisdom. Look at my friend, she's showing wisdom by finishing her homework, by raising her hand. They get to see these examples done by themselves, done by people that look like them, but done by their friends and their relatives. This last one um, on the far right, Maka Onia Ohunkaka, you can see is illustrated. So we have a handful of illustrators, some indigenous um, uh, who are helping make books at different levels. Um, and this one in particular, I love. Um, it was illustrated by a Lakota artist and um, it is about the origin of Buffalo. How did Buffalo come to be? 
And so we are able to make all of these books that are relevant to now, as well as books that are about our history and our traditional Lakota stories. Um, so this is this one is geared more towards the higher grades, so third through fifth, but um, we have a curriculum from K through fifth currently um, in this format where we're not only making these books and you know having them read them, we're also developing lessons in regards to these stories. So they get to read these books, these stories, and we're focusing on key grammar of it. We're focusing on grant or and uh, vocabulary, key vocabulary, and how to implement that into a sentence, into a narrative, um, as well as its comprehension. So they get to ask and retell and have discussions about these stories. What do they think of it? Who's the main character? What's the setting? What's the moral? Um, so these aren't just, you know, these aren't just books. We're creating an entire curriculum based on these books that are relevant to them, that are based on our Lakota way of life. Um, I wanted to show, showcase some pictures. I'm obviously very proud of my kids. Um, I wanted to really emphasize this idea that I didn't really understand until I joined this movement, which was indigenous immersion programs. Every single one is going to be very unique and special in their own way, because all of our tribes are unique and special in different ways. Our languages are different, our customs, our ceremonies, our songs, our prayers, everything is different. And so our Lakota immersion program uh, is gonna be different than anybody, anybody else's, any other tribes, I should say. Um, and I wanted to just highlight some of the beauty in what our immersion program is. Um, so you see students cutting buffalo from uh, our buffalo harvest. There's one of my students that's, that is uh, cutting off the hide from the buffalo. I think that might've been his first time doing that. Um, and you see, we hold wachipis, powwows for our students so that they get to dress in their regalia and we have fun. We, have, we do potato dances, rabbit dances. Um, this picture in the middle of our boys and our girls singing, um, I think this was during summer school and it was really nice out and they wanted to sing uh, because they sing every single day. Um, they learn different songs every single day and it's because they felt like it, they were excited to, they wanted to go outside and sing. And so we did, we were all outside. They were singing different songs, having fun. Um, on the bottom left, you see some of our girls wearing ribbon skirts because that's normal. That's the norm for our students, for our teachers to wear ribbon skirts, to just be proud in who we are. The bottom right, you see one of my students is painting her drum, which she had made from scratch. She put the wood together. She uh, put the hide on top of it. She tied it together and now she's painting it. So this is part of our program where we're very intentional of celebrating who we are. And so this leads me to my master of arts degree in indigenous education that I got from Arizona State University. I knew from the get-go that my capstone project was gonna be about our immersion program, uh, but I didn't know what angle I was going to take on it because I'm not a data person. Um, our data is really good. And we, I have colleagues who love data and that is, that's their field, um, but that isn't necessarily mine um, because you know they are academically successful and the numbers show that in the standardized testing and everything, but, I wanted to go deeper. And so I had this long discussion with one of my professors and she said, well, just, just talk to me about your work. Talk to me about your students and we can, we can figure out something from there. And so I began talking about it, like how I'm sharing with you all now. Um, and this memory came up and I wanted to tell her this story, which was some years back, we took a field trip to Wind Cave. And Wind Cave is where Lakota people originated from. That's where we came from. 
And we had a park ranger that was leading our students around and one of our students raised her hands and she asked a question in Lakota. And the park ranger probably never heard Lakota before in her life. She was very taken aback. She didn't know what to do. Um, and so I stepped in and I said, oh, she said in Lakota, are there spirits here? And the park ranger took it as a joke. She laughed and she said, no, of course not, and kept walking. Um, but I saw in our student that she was very serious in that question because us as Lakota people, we do believe that there are spirits that watch over us, that are here to help us, especially in our place of origin. You know, that's we definitely believe that there are good spirits that are there. Um, and later on, that student came up to me and she said, why didn't, why didn't that woman understand me? And I said, well, she doesn't know Lakota. Um, and my student, she looked very confused and she said, what? how does she not know Lakota? It was like completely baffled, um, which was such a huge moment that I, she probably didn't notice, but I noticed where we had come from this education system where it, uh, where you couldn't speak your language, your indigenous languages, you couldn't sing your songs, you couldn't be indigenous, right? Um, and to the point where we lost our languages, where it wasn't normal to speak our language anymore. Um, many people are, very few people are fluent to the point where now these students are confused at someone not knowing the Lakota language. It completely flipped, right? For them, it's normalized to know our language, to pray in our ways, to, to be Lakota. And so it was weird for her to see someone that doesn't know our language, which uh, at that point I was emotional with my professor and she said, that's it. Like, that's what you need to focus on. And so it clicked for me um, that we were going to focus on the emotional and mental impact of this immersion program because that is what is most important to me. And it's very personal to me. As I have said, you know, with my educational experience, feeling very lost, there's these students who are not very sure in who they are. And so my research um, was, I conducted this very long interview with our students and I focused on our sense of belonging, our sense of self-worth, our cultural identity and pride to community which are all four categories that are very, very personal to me. And I wanted to share these findings with you briefly in a succinct way, um, because what better way to showcase our program than through our kids, right? Through our kids' words and their experiences. Um, so with this interview I had with our students, it was just a group discussion um, and a little side note, we were all going in and out of Lakota in English because that was natural for us. So that's how our interview was going, was in both languages. Um, and I asked them, you know, do you feel like you belong here? Do you feel like you belong in your community? And they all, without hesitation, yes, yes, yes. And one student said, I love practicing our Lakota way because it keeps us safe. And I wanted to take a moment with that quote because for so long, Indigenous peoples haven't felt safe in a classroom, right? That, you know, dating back to the 1880s, we, were, it, we weren't supposed to feel safe. We, and since then we haven't, but these group of students do. They come to school and they feel safe. And this naturally with them, not prompted by me, turned into a discussion about boarding schools. And they acknowledge that, they acknowledge that their elders, their ancestors don't feel safe and or they didn't feel safe and how lucky they are to feel loved and feel like they belong here. We went on to talk about sense of self-worth um, and this was such a beautiful conversation. I loved this. Um, they all said that they feel like they're beyond good enough because they're Lakota. Like they, they felt good enough because they're Lakota and they all see themselves as leaders. So they think of themselves highly, which is incredible. Um, 
And so we continue to talk about this discussion of leadership and how are you a leader? How do you show that you're a leader? And one student said, a leader must watch over their camp, which is such an old way of saying something like that, right? Like it sounds like an elder would say that. And so that's just highlighting, you know, how our education system, it being designed, you know, in a Lakota-based education, they are, they are getting in touch with our beliefs, our teachings. Um, and the students continued on to talk about the Lakota values, um, not unprompted by me. They were saying, well, I show compassion, I show respect, I show bravery, and they were giving specific examples of that they do in school and outside of school. And they express that they see themselves as leaders wherever they go. Um, so then we moved on to cultural identity. And this was a very, um, very quick conversation because it was just so obvious to them. They were baffled that I even brought it up. They, they were saying, yeah, what well, we've been surrounded by our culture our entire lives. What do you mean? This is our entire these are our days, our um, our summers, our school days, everything. We're surrounded by our culture. And so I asked them, well, what are specific ways that our program, that our schooling shows that or highlights or celebrates our cultural identity? And they brought up the buffalo harvest. Um, they harvested corn and made soup with the corn. They put up teepees every single summer. Uh, they make drums. They get to sing. We get to pray. They, they listed everything that we do in our in our daily routines that's normal for them and one student um did bring up the fact that they felt very lucky that this is their schooling because they said well i have a cousin who goes to a different school on the reservation and they don't even know how to put up a teepee and the other students were upset about that they were like what they don't they, they never learned how to put up a teepee and the student said, yeah, they don't, they don't learn the things that we learn. And then they continue to express that they're just so happy that they get to, that this is their schooling, is going outside and putting up a teepee. <laughs> Lastly, what I talked about with them was pride, the sense of pride, which is, as, as you all know, um, was very, very close to my heart because I spent many of my years not feeling proud of who I was. Um, and they all expressed that they are proud of being Lakota. And one student said, I show I'm proud by just being Lakota all the time. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> this, this, I think, was such a profound statement um, because growing up, I didn't feel like I could be indigenous all the time. I couldn't show myself being Lakota, Anishinaabe, Taos Pueblo. Um, there, there are many environments where I felt like I just had to put my head down and be silent and just go with the flow, right? But these students, they don't know anything different. They, they are Lakota all the time in any environment that they walk in, in a McDonald's, in a Walmart, anywhere, they're just Lakota with their long hair and they're, they're speaking in Lakota. My sisters who are in this program, um, we speak Lakota every day in public. We will go to town and we're speaking in Lakota and it's normal. Um, they never have felt this need to close off or to not feel proud. So just to close this out um, as a reflection, um, I began teaching and learning Lakota Yapi in 2018, and that has forever changed my life. Um, it has influenced my life habits, my behaviors, my perspective. Um, something that isn't talked about a lot is, you know, whenever you're learning your indigenous language, you start, your way of thinking shifts. Um, my way of thinking shifts, my way of talking in English has even shifted because I am now thinking more in a Lakota perspective. I'm thinking like, how would you say this in Lakota? Well, that's not how you'd say it in English. And that's a weird way of saying it in English. You know, my go-to now is Lakota. My mindset 
is Lakota. And um, I'm even dreaming in Lakota. Most of the time I dream in Lakota these days. Um, and just this job, these children, they, they don't even know it yet that they are the leaders. Sorry. <laughs> um, they are the leaders of this movement. They are at the forefront. And me and my colleagues were just, we're here to just guide them along, you know, and celebrate them and watch them go. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. And I, I've only just started, you know, 2018 isn't that long ago. Um, and I have my whole life ahead of me to learn to become more fluent. That's what I'm excited for, you know, just, just keep growing in this capacity through my language, through my mentality, my emotional well-being, um, my spirituality. This is an ongoing lifestyle. It's not even a, a job at this point. This is this is a lifestyle and a way of being. So, um, Ine, I am done. Um, you can see my two sisters who are in the look, uh, immersion program up at the top right. Their first language is Lakota, and they've been on this journey with me this whole time. But, yeah. Oh, Sierra, thank you so much. Um, you've moved me to tears. Uh, I think we all know, those of us who've been in the language movement for a long time, even for a short time, that it's not just about language. And what you shared with us through your personal journey, stories, and the consequences of all your teaching the kids that this is about um, the diverse aspects of what language can do for the people. And um, it's really it's really been very, very informative and touching. And you are brave to share your personal journey stories. That was, I could see why it was important for us to know. So thank you. Okay, so now we're going to take a 10 minute break. And what I want to emphasize is this is a time for you to post your questions on the Q&A box, not the chat box. I was wrong. In the Q&A box, please post your questions. We already have a few and I will um, come back in 10 minutes and then we will discuss not all probably, but hopefully most of the questions posted. So. And please don't push any buttons when you leave, just leave and leave the screen on and we'll see you back at 1010. That's mountain time, sorry, in 10 minutes. Okay, I hope everybody is back. And uh, once again, I thank you, Sierra, for um, the wonderful presentation. And I was looking through a lot of these questions and everybody starts off by, Thank you for your wonderful presentation and for sharing such a personal but relevant experience. So um, I'd like to start by asking a few questions that I uh, see is of interest to many of you. Uh, let me start with one that says, um, are you willing to share your contact information if people want to contact you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. If so, maybe put it in uh, either chat or Q&A, either place, I guess. Okay. You can type it in. And uh, so for those of you who want to follow up. And uh, the first question I'll ask is um, Amara or Amara. I hope I said your name right, Amara. <laughs> can you talk about your parent involvement if and if any language learning is happening at home? or continuing after the kids leave the classroom? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, our, our parents are very, very supportive of this. Um, coming into kindergarten, you know, they all, um, we have a meeting with them and we say this is a commitment of not only your student of, but of you. And um, we do have some parents that do take the nightly adult Lakota language classes. Um, not many, but um, I mean, understandably, like it's five nights a week. Uh, it's and they have children. It's very busy, but um, yeah, they're 
they're very, very supportive. And there are some parents who do reach out to me for resources so that they can help their students at home uh, with vocabulary and such. Um, I'll have parents reach out saying, well, do you have key um, vocabulary to use at home, such as cooking or going to bed, getting ready for school? And so uh, we provide those resources. I, I make flyers or little posters for uh, kids to take home and for parents to have. Thank you. Um, another question is, you have also um, ancestry in Taos Pueblo, and her question from Gloria is, do you know the Taos language? Oh, I want to. I really want to. That's that. That's definitely my goals for the future is to learn uh, Tiwa and also um, get fluent in um, Anishinaabe. Um, it's but it's, it's a slow process because I'm so invested in this right now. But I think whenever our uh, curriculum and our program gets to a settled place, um, then I, I'm definitely going to pursue that. I think you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> what I see is determination and a very disciplined approach to learning. So, well, thanks for sharing that. Um, from Kella. Thank you for sharing your personal experience and your story that led you to your path of teaching. Um, oh, there was a question from Kella. That was a comment. But her question was, oh, where are you? Here we go. Uh, how have immersion classes changed uh, for the families? And, and in the families, do you see any changes? I do. Um... I very much do. Uh, there are a lot of students that actually came in. Um, that this is just the first one that came to mind. But there are students that came into kindergarten. The boys had short hair. Now they, now they don't. They just started growing that out. Or whenever we have events at school, we don't tell them to dress. However, anyway, but we'll have our students coming wearing ribbon shirts, wearing ribbon skirts, um, and our families are uh, just very, very supportive of that. Or they'll talk, they'll tell me different stories about how uh, one student one time uh, got mad at her mom because her mom stepped on a flower and she was like, that's a relative. Like, well, you shouldn't be stepping on a flower. Um, so yeah, those, we just get stories like that all the time. Mm. Those are important stories in terms of data, <laughs> right? So that brings me to a nice long comment from Camilio, um, and I won't read the whole thing. He says, you mentioned you're not a data person. However, you have been dealing with data and synthesizing the Lakota data unknowingly. And he himself says, I'm a data person um, and a huge fan of indigenous data. How are you now Lakota all the time? What do you, how do you define that, I guess? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess I, um, there are many times throughout my life where I would just be silent. If something made me uncomfortable, I'd be silent about it, or I would just kind of, you know, try to be, I'd like try to blend in with the wall, right? Um, but now, you know, I, I don't worry if I'm the only brown person in the room, really, like I, I'm comfortable enough in my own skin, and I don't worry about people looking at me if I'm talking in Lakota. Um, that was and that I learned from my kids because they're just they're themselves all the time. And I'm like, oh, I got to I'm a role model for them. I got to be that way, too, <laughs> you know. And so naturally, it's just helped me become more confident in myself. So several people and I hope I don't miss anybody, but the names I've written down, Laura and Ramona uh, and several others have asked how do you help motivate people to, to, to pursue the learning of the language? That adult, mainly adult, I think they're talking about, right? It, that is hard um, because like I've said, it's such a personal uh, choice, I think. Um, so we can't, we can't make people go out and learn the language. Um, but, you know, I think for me, it was, it's just naturally making connections with people and, um, you know, just kind of asking like, hey, would you like, are, would you ever be interested in learning 
Lakota and, you know, and then especially showcasing our program and our kids, you know, like whenever they see our kids talking that that is naturally motivating for a lot of people to see what it's doing for our kids, for myself and my colleagues. And they're interested in that. And they say, well, how can I learn? Um, and, and, you know, me being an adult language teacher, I'm like, well, we offer free classes on zoom, like come join, just check it out. And that's kind of always my approach is like, just try it, which is how I got into all of this is I just tried it out. <laughs> I think one of the things we noticed, it's a hard process. It's not easy for anybody. So they have to understand that it takes work, right? <laughs> but making it fun, sounds mm -hmm. like your classes would be fun. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, wow, there's so many good questions here, but let's see. Oh. Wow, let's see. I, I had one more. Oh, for all your um, books that you created, do you have a publisher who publishes them? How do you manage that? We um, we publish in-house, actually. Uh, we ordered a big old bookmaker, and so we make them here. And we also have a, a website. I worked, with, um, I worked with someone to develop a website where we're uploading all of our books that are accessible to our students so they can just log on to their iPads or phones or anything and just read from anywhere. Oh, oh, great. That's good. So another one, uh, this might be of interest to a lot of the question from Elaine. We do immersion in the morning and in the afternoon, students attend local schools. So what assessments do you use in the reading? Mm -hmm. um, we our, we develop our own um, since this this is all new territory. Every single year is new territory as we get older with our students. We also have our students take standardized testing in English um, mm -hmm. and our students test at or above national average. Um, so yeah, we have we have different different assessments and we're in the process of um, fixing up our assessment that we have now and in, in putting it into this uh, website. So that's what, that's what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm sort of jumping around topics, but I'm kind of just scrolling down and checking. And John is asking, tell us a little bit more about your free adult classes on Zoom. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's four levels, uh, beginner, intermediate, high intermediate, and advanced. Um, and they start in August and go all the way up to May. Um, five nights a week, one hour, uh, Sunday through Thursday. Um, and so I teach at the highest level and my other, my colleagues, uh, two of my colleagues, they teach level three, level two, and then one of my students teaches level one. Um, so we're uh, able to see, you know, the results are like the snowball effect, right? Like my students are now teaching classes, but um, yeah, if you should, if you reach out to me, um, then I can get you in contact with the person that runs our adult language program. Okay. So maybe the same info about, there's a question about your URL of your website with books. If Are the books shareable? Are you sharing that widely or? Um, I'm, that's something I'll have to ask my boss. It, it, it's from what I understand right now, it's just for our students and other, other educators who are in Lakota immersion, like at other schools, we share with them. Absolutely. But I'll have to, um, ask my boss about, about sharing it widely. Okay. And I'll pick another one from uh, Amara because we hear this a lot and we're curious how you deal with this, uh, do you deal with community members who are pushing back or giving you you're doing it wrong or saying it wrong? Also, other teachers or even community members who deliberately won't use the language. So those are two different things. How do you deal with that? Um, yes, so it's that is a constant, constant thing. Um, a fight of over orthography usage, which orthography to use, um, whether it's okay to even be teaching it in a classroom setting. Um, we hear it, yeah, uh, all the time from many different people. Um, but how, I guess how I deal with it is, you know, I, I don't 
really acknowledge it because I'm um, like the people who are talking the most are probably doing the least work. <laughs> um, so I let our work speak for us, right? I don't, I don't want to fight back. I, I want to focus on what's actually important, which is our kids and our kids are speaking and are proud and they're happy. And that's what matters about this. Um, it's not what orthography to use. It's, you know, all of that to me feels like noise. Um, when they could be creating something for our kids, right? Um, instead of just talking and being mean. And um, yeah, that's, so that's how I deal with this. I just realize our priority is our kids, no matter what, and pushing this language forward so that it can be normalized throughout our community. Oh, you're muted, you know. <laughs> you started in the daycare center. So um, there's a question from Carolyn. I'm interested in an update on the growth and success of the daycare. Um, I am not too sure about the daycare. We, um, this organization took on the daycare that is not part of Red Cloud. And so um, I'm, I'm not actually sure. I do believe that they still have a daycare, um, but uh, at, we, yeah, we haven't associated with them in a few years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> interesting question. So one uh, person was saying, do you, um, Angel or Angel, I don't know which, how it's, standardized testing is not optimal for positive learning environments and standardized testing has been the proven to set students up for failure. Why even bother doing standardized testing? Maybe this is a comment, but I just had to throw that out. It's, re um, it's required mm. for us. Uh, we can't, we, we, are, we are trying to fight it because we do know that Hawaii um, doesn't do any testing uh, with their immersion program. And so we are fighting it, um, but right now our hands are tied. We, we, is required. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, oh, sorry. Uh, it, and also it does kind of help with the naysayers, right? There are many people who are like, well, what about them learning in English? Are they going to know English? Are they going to thrive in the real world? Which is what I've heard. Um, and we have these test scores to shape, to say, well, they're testing at and above national average in English, despite not learning in English. So that it, it can help um, with that. Mm -hmm. A uh, question from Jerry Hill. How has your teaching the language impacted your own family? A lot. <laughs> it's impacted it a lot. My, oh, Matt is, um, Matt is my stepdad, um, the one who kind of got this going in 2012. And um, it's really brought our family together. Like my my little, two little sister or three of my little sisters are in the immersion program right now. Um, and so that's been a beautiful experience with them where I get to speak to them in the language. I also teach my older, my, my siblings who are <clears throat> in high school, they take our classes, our nightly classes. And so, and my mom does as well. She takes my class. Mm -hmm. So it's become this beautiful bonding experience for all of us, um, where we're, we're all in this movement together. Wow. <laughs> One spark became a big fire, eh? Yep. <laughs> okay, I'm mindful of the time. So I want to leave uh, the Latin last two, three minutes to you, Sierra, to, to make any comments you wish. And, and to remind you to please post your um, contact information. Oh yeah, oh, you already did. Okay, but um, I, I just thank you all for giving me this opportunity for um, me to speak. It's I there have been like there have been many times throughout this uh, job and uh, my journey where it's been really hard. Uh, where I have I have experienced hate and I have experienced hate say, or naysayers and um uh yeah I and I think you know just this journey has been very beautiful overall um and healing so 
before joining this movement, if there were haters, if there were naysayers, I would probably crumble, right? Mm -hmm. That's because I didn't have a strong foundation in who I was, but now I can, I can just acknowledge, okay, there are some people who aren't, who aren't supportive of this or who don't, who don't even know the work that we're doing. That's a lot of it is that they don't understand the beauty and the impact that is this program. Um, and it's just been beautiful to watch myself grow and my family grow and my students grow. Okay, so with that, we will say thank you again to Lannan Foundation for making this possible. And there's seven more to come. So keep, keep an eye out for our email. And um, thank you to Sierra. And thank you to all of you who have participated and um, listened in. But also please know this is recorded, will be in the ILI uh, YouTube channel. So we will announce that link at some point very soon when it's up. And uh, for Alyssa Sierra's contact, go to the chat. Uh, yeah, in the chat, she put up the um, email address. Sorry, email. So make sure you go to that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, at our next symposium. I know we're having one on April 7th. And more, more info on that as we con contact you. All right, thank All you right. so much.